So a warm welcome again to the audience all over the world for the second part on the second in the second session of this uh, Congress and it's a kind of round table with four speakers every speaker 15 minutes, please I want to ask you on the screens. Uh, uh, type your questions into the chat and we discuss some after all the four speakers and the slogan the topic of this session now is palliative care everywhere and for everyone maybe it's a little bit of a development we had a congress here palliative care everywhere and by everyone and now it's quite brave for everyone that's quite an issue and we want to start with xavier gomez from spain catalonia he's online on screen i hope and he's a specialist for palliative care but also he's a geriatric geriatric yeah. so he is uh, he takes care for the elderly not only for the cancer patients is yeah, video uh, thank you very much for this opportunity we got to share our experience and our wishes to look after people with advanced chronic conditions and palliative care, which is one of the most important challenges in the last decades in palliative care evolution. So let's um, go forward to, to do so. I'm doing so from our chair of palliative care and with experience in long-term and chronic palliative care in the last few years. If we look at the results of palliative care services in the last years, we can see that there are many things that we achieved, which is mainly symptom control and also some other issues in uh, care of patients and families. And also from the public health perspective, we can um, identify several aspects to improve. Um, and we did so 10 to 12 years ago, and we identified that low coverage for non-cancer patients in the community or in other services than palliative care, and then psychosocial issues, and then academic positions, and more than this also uh, insertion in the, into society were the most important uh, challenges to address in the next years. So we started to uh, elaborate these conceptual transitions in palliative care in the 20th century, 21st century. And the most important changes is changing from terminal cancer to advanced chronic non-cancer and all patients with conditions like multimorbidity, frailty, or dependency uh, that have different, um, different uh, conditions and disease that cause this end of life um, situation or this limited life prognosis. It means that we were based initially in palliative care services focus on cancer terminal patients. Now we have to focus on populations that have uh, people with uh, advanced chronic conditions and cause 75% of the mortality and 1.5% of the prevalence. So based in this, um, in this um, constatation that we, we, we saw, we were able to describe the palliative care needs from a population-based uh, perspective. And you can look at this, looking at the mortality, then it's 75% of people, and then one uh, on two die because of cancer, and the others, it's they die for non-cancer conditions, but also, you can look at this, uh, looking at the prevalence, which is how many people need palliative care at the same time in our population. So we did this paper several years ago. It's recent, but it's very systematic. 
and we could see that 1.5 percent of the population in our country have um, uh, advanced chronic conditions but also a part of these people have also uh, social needs like poverty solitude conflict etc etc or lim limitations of access and if we look that in settings we see that the 35 percent of the beds in hospitals are occupied by people with advanced chronic conditions and limited life prognosis and if we look at the GP's workload, we see that 20 patients at least are on the um, GP's list having uh, chronic advanced conditions. And also that it's even bigger in nursing homes, which is the prevalence of 60 to 70%. Who are these people? These people are mainly people with multimorbidity, uh, older age, so it's more than 80, mainly women with multimorbidity, frailty and high levels of dementia. And also there is another proportion of people uh, younger with male pred predominant, which are mainly um, suffering from cancer or other um, uh, organ failures like cardiac failure, renal failure, etc. So these are these are the composition of causes of this population who needs palliative care. Now we can look at them and can identify them very easily with uh, several uh, tools that we did uh, with the NECPAL tool, which is not only identifying people with palliative care needs but also adding the prognosis estimation in this uh, population. So just mixing the surprise question and six parameters, which are very clinical. If we look at the number of parameters who are affected, that's a question of minutes in patients that we know, we can uh, estimate the stage one, which is one or two parameters, 38 months of uh, median survival, or stage two, three, four parameters, 17 months of, of um, median survival, or stage T, which is three or four months of median survival. So it's very easy now to establish the, the time that to, uh, to deterioration and also to establish um, a prognostic or estimate prognostic in this a kind of uh, situations and also we have developed an APP which is a very simple way of establishing this estimation in individual patients but if we look at the proportion of these people who access palliative care and the gaps that we can identify we can identify that there is the and there are situations who are uh, situations in which your probability of looking be looked after by a palliative care service is much less much uh, lower for instance if you are a woman with dementia more than 85 years old or severe distress loneliness poverty widow or limited access in rural of metropolitan areas or abuse of a conflict your probability of being looked after by a palliative care service is much lower. So this is a gap in our uh, situation, even in countries in which the palliative care development is quite high. If we look at our experience in Catalonia, uh, looking at the prevalence of 112,000 people who are the estimation of people with advanced chronic conditions, we can see that the 38% are looked after by palliative care services, which is um, this figure. And then uh, another 29% are identified and looked after by primary care services. So we have 68% of people who are already looked after either by palliative care services or primary care, but we have 
people who are not identified nor attended, which is um, more than 30% of the population. And if we look at this population, we identified that uh, at least a part of these people are people with multimorbidity and this criteria of women, more than 85, loneliness, poverty, dementia, etc. Uh, and more, most of them don't have any access to palliative care services and are suffering around the system, the healthcare and social care system. And also we know there are gaps by place. So if we look at nursing homes, especially hospitals, emergencies, or by territories, for instance, some rural areas on poor urban districts, these, in these places, in these settings, the access of palliative care can be lower. We know very well what to do if somebody is identified. We have worked a, a lot on this, so we, we know how to do that. And also we know how to do the improvement of services of, um, and palliative care measures in conventional services, which is mainly, you know, changes in organization, changes in, in uh, competence of professionals and also increasing the access of patients and families to the care. Um, and also we know that many uh, territorial or national palliative care plans still being focuses mainly in cancer patients and need to focus now <clears throat> in a wider perspective of people with advanced chronic conditions. So this is another challenge that we got to change this perspective uh, into a more um, open more, and wider perspective. So this is also a challenge to be made by specialist palliative care services, which are in many countries uh, focused mainly in cancer terminal patients. And they have to open their uh, doors and their windows to the society and to the population to identify people that could be uh, improved in their care with cooperation with other services, mainly in the community and involving the community. The other big and uh, very strong challenge is to improve the psychosocial and spiritual care as one of the challenges and one of the, the gaps that we, we identified several years ago. So for doing so, we had the opportunity to develop a program for this comprehensive care funded by La Caixa Foundation in Barcelona and also designed by our WHO Collaborating Center. And this um, uh, program has been implementing 45 psychosocial teams, uh, mainly composed by psychologists and social workers and these people have been looking after more than 500,000 people in Spain and also now in Portugal in the last 12 years. And also they have uh, appointed more than 240 professionals and more than 1,500 volunteers. So this is a huge program that has been addressed to focus on these psychosocial needs of people with advanced chronic conditions. And we are very proud of this uh, program. And then the other challenge of evolving society, it's very important because the, the national system, healthcare system cannot offer all the, the, the aspects that uh, any person with advanced chronic conditions need in the community and also there is a need, an urgent need to change the social perspectives of care and end of life care in the society, in the community. So I'm based in this, um, there are um, um, quite a lot of um, institutions and also community leaders and societies who have developed uh, compassive communities projects as we did 
uh, to change this perspective of ethnic life in the society and also to identify people with special psychosocial needs in the community like poverty or isolation to give them more comprehensive support and involving society in their care <clears throat> and finally we think that inserting this in the academy and in the in the uh, university and also in the teaching and training of uh, healthcare professionals is essential so this is an example of people of um, uh, with advanced chronic conditions teaching from themselves medical students about um, the principles of good palliative care <clears throat> this is a session that is very appreciated by students and also by by patients that come to give the patients their perspective of how is a good doctor what is a good doctor and also we can develop integrated palliative care um, programs and services with this open perspective community based and also public health oriented so finally <coughs> sorry we have to say that the palliative and chronic pair must be integrated and there are people with advanced chronic conditions uh, with multimorbidity, frailty, organ failure, and psychosocial needs that don't have usual access to palliative care and that must be addressed by programs and services and communities. And this, um, this uh, challenge must be seen as an opportunity by palliative care services and in which um, the psychosocial and spiritual needs are essential components involving the society and involving also the academy with pre-graduate and postgraduate training. All these uh, actions can be done with vision, leadership and commitment. So this is my aunt and my mother, who are 100 years old. In the last day, they see each other. And that uh, demonstrates that you can have also uh, love and compassion and humor at the end of your life. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. And I, I hope that we will be able to um, discuss this in the, in the session afterwards with the other colleagues. Thank you very much indeed. Recording in progress. Hey, thanks to Professor Thomas. Uh, we remember uh, there is this. Okay, uh, we remember question by uh, by chat. Uh, there was a, a, a question concerning palliative sedation, asking which uh, document or statement of uh, Catholic Church about uh, palliative sedation. I remember uh, an important message by the Secretary of State of, uh, uh, on February uh, 2018, so 2018 uh, about this uh, issue. And uh, you can find short but relevant uh, statement in the new charter of healthcare workers and so two important documents that can update the official position of the church catholic church that is also present in the encyclica evangelium vitae of john paul ii 1995. Um, now we have uh, the second uh, video recorded uh, presentation by Professor uh, Julia Downing, Honorary Professor of Palliative Care at the Makerere University, Kampala, and Executive Director of the International Children's Palliative Care Network. And the topic is uh, uh, palliative care in pediatrics. Uh, please. Hello. My name is Professor Julia Downing and I'm the Chief Executive of the International Children's Palliative Care Network. 
and I'm delighted to be talking to you today about palliative care everywhere and for everyone, specifically looking at the issue of paediatric palliative care. So why are we looking at this? Well, we need to make sure that all children, wherever they live around the world, with whatever condition they might have, who need access to palliative care, will have access to quality care for themselves and for their families in order to improve their quality of life. So it's very important that in the whole context of palliative care, we think about children. Let's think about initially the definition of children's palliative care. Well, the World Health Organization gave a definition of children's palliative care back in 2002. And I'm not gonna read it all out, but importantly, it's the active total care of the child's body, mind and spirit. So we're looking at total care. It is not just about the child, but it's about their family. It begins when illness is diagnosed or even before diagnosis. Many children, particularly those with rare conditions and those in low income countries, may never have an official diagnosis. And it continues regardless as to whether a child is receiving treatment directed at the disease. And it continues into end of life care and into bereavement. It's about the child's physical, psychological and social distress. It's provided through a multidisciplinary team. And very importantly, palliative care can be provided even when resources are limited, and it can be provided across a range of settings, such as tertiary care facilities, in community health centres, and even in the child's own home. So palliative care defined by the World Health Organization. But who needs palliative care? And why do we need palliative care for children? Well, the Global Atlas of Palliative Care identified that about 7% of those globally needing palliative care are children. And we've just heard about palliative care for the elderly, and we know that the highest percentage, 40%, are for adults over 70 years. But we mustn't forget that 70% of those needing palliative care are children. And we can see here from this other graph that over half of those come from within uh, the Afro region of WHO, so from within um, Africa. And so a great need for children's palliative care. And if we look at some of the data, there's been various studies done looking at how many children globally need access to palliative care, ranging from uh, about 2.5 million needing end of life care uh, through to 21.1 million uh, children needing access to palliative care with 8 million requiring specialized service provision. The Lancet Commission developed a new way of looking at this data and they found that over 5.3 million children aged under 15 years experience serious health related suffering each year worldwide. That figure in the latest version of the Global Atlas was 3.9 million, but since then there's been a recognition that the calculations uh, were not necessarily done in the best way and we're currently redoing that and the figures are coming out a lot higher and more in line with the 8 million requiring specialist palliative care. So there's clearly a need for palliative care for children around the world. And just as an example, there's been various um, atlases developed in different parts of the world which have looked at the provision of children's palliative care. And this is the um, European uh, atlas um, which has identified um, where there is access to children's palliative care. Um, only seven countries have uh, perinatal palliative care um, and uh, 14 um, countries have a component of paediatric palliative care in their training for doctors and 16 um, in their training for nurses. Um, and there are just 20 countries um, across Europe with specialised paediatric palliative care consultants. And so clearly uh, there is a need for the ongoing development of children's palliative care. If we look at the global status of children's palliative care, this was back in 2011. This is the ICPCN's estimate of global children's palliative care provision. And the countries in the darker green have the most developed children's palliative care. And those countries in white had no known children's palliative care development. 
um, spring forward to 2019 and you can see there have been many developments um, within children's palliative care around the world. But there are still countries where we don't know if there's any children's palliative care services available. And there are still many countries where we need to develop the services further so that eventually this map gets turned dark green. So there's still a big need for children's palliative care development. But the time is right for that. We have the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we have the Declaration of Astana, which is looking at primary health care. And palliative care is a core component of that. Palliative care is also a core component of universal health coverage. Um, we've had the World Health Assembly um, resolution on palliative care. We've had the Lancet Commission report. And of course, COVID-19 has uh, shone a spotlight on the need for palliative care. So if there isn't palliative care for children, if children around the world don't have access to palliative care, then universal health coverage is not being provided. Primary health care is not being provided. And so we have an impetus at the moment to really help strengthen and develop children's palliative care. Now, there are many principles of palliative care in children, and um, obviously I could uh, take uh, the day talking about them, but just to highlight some of the principles of palliative care in children. It's got to be across the continuum of care. We need to be providing palliative care for children in the hospitals, in the home, um, in the health centres, in the community, even in schools. We need to make sure that there is good pain and symptom management. And we don't just mean uh, physical, but if we think about the concept of total pain, uh, the physical, the psychological, the social and the spiritual, we need to be addressing all of these issues. And of course, if we're going to manage children's pain and other symptoms, we need to have access to the medicines that we need. Emotional support is key, social issues, spiritual issues, and then of course end of life care, bereavement care. Communication is key, how do we communicate some of the challenging issues with children and their families? How do we tell um, a young child about their prognosis, about their condition, about the fact that they're dying? How do we support families and relatives to do that? How do we care for the family and significant others? And what about the financial issues? We know from experience, we know that having a child uh, that needs palliative care can really um, impact the family financially and in many places it can cause the family to spiral deeper into poverty. And obviously there is a great need for teamwork, not just within health professionals but within the teachers, within religious leaders, within community leaders. So many principles of palliative care in children. But we also know that there are challenges to the development of children's palliative care and if we just look at those maps that we've looked at already we can see that there is um, a need for ongoing development. So what are the challenges that we face in the development of children's palliative care? Well we know that in many countries even when cure is theoretically possible it's often not realistic. This might be due to an uneven distribution of services. In some countries, for example, if a child has got cancer, there may only be one centre in the country um, that manages children with cancer. Children often present late. In many countries, particularly across sub-Saharan Africa, over 80% of children will present with advanced disease when cure is no longer possible expense of treatment and it might not just be the actual cost of treatment which in some places might be free but the expense um, of maybe being away from home of having um, a family member staying with the child in the hospital um, meaning that they uh, are not able to work uh, they're not able to earn funds so the cost of having a child who needs palliative care is immense there might be a lack of awareness on children's palliative care. I mean, why do we need children's palliative care? I was speaking to the Minister of Health in one country um, in Europe who, when we talked about children's palliative care, said, we don't need children's palliative care, our children don't die. If only that was the case and we were able to do just a quick and dirty needs assessment and show the need for children's palliative care. 
And so there's a lack of recognition of what children's palliative care is, what it can provide for the child and their family, and the need for it. There's also a lack of technical skills and expertise. How many of our doctors, how many of our nurses are trained in children's palliative care? What about policy? Is there policy um, from the national, regional and, and global levels that really supports the provision of children's palliative care? Access to the medicines that they need, service delivery, the education that they need. Talking about education, in many places there's a lack of access to education. In these countries where there isn't any known children's palliative care, how do we provide education and training on children's palliative care? Um, what about the management and treatment? Um, what about trained professionals? And um, we've already mentioned uh, the need for access to medicines, and not just access to uh, the medicines generically, but access to paediatric formulations as well. In many places, there's a lack of integration into the health service for all ages. So how do we integrate palliative care, children's palliative care, into the health service? and a lack of resources for providing such care. For us as health professionals, there's often the challenge as well of how do we recognise the complex needs of children requiring palliative care and provide palliative care that meets their needs? And how do we provide children's palliative care that is appropriate to the cultural context, to the religious context, to the situation within the country? Uh, we can't just lift one model of children's palliative care from one country and put it into another. We need to make sure that the children's palliative care that we provide it is, is um, critical to uh, the context in which it is being provided. How do we get that balance between cure versus care? For many people, there is a fear of providing palliative care for children. I've spoken to many people who work in palliative care for adults, but they say, don't give us a child. We, we um, fear palliative care for children. And there's that feeling by health professionals, particularly with children, of not wanting to be seen as giving up on a child. Uh, many people see palliative care is giving up and we need to reframe that. Palliative care is not about giving up. Palliative care is about life. Palliative care is about living. Palliative care is about enabling the children and their families to have the best possible quality of life. So how do we do that? Well the World Health Organization has this conceptual model which looks at the provision of integrated palliative care services and the need for um, essential medicines for education and training, for research, for the health policies and for an empowered people and communities. So key. And if we look at all these different aspects um, that make up this conceptual module, then we are able to um, look at what we need to do in order to develop and strengthen children's palliative care services. We need to make sure the education is available, the medicines are available, that there are policies in place, that the people and communities are empowered, uh, that there is research um, to provide the data to um, give strength to our arguments and our advocacy for children's palliative care. There are a wide range of children's palliative care services available around the world. Uh, here are just a few examples of in Indonesia, in the UK, in Malawi, um, perinatal palliative care. Um, how about the services that use modern technology? Uh, M Health, the use of pain apps. This is a, um, a game that is being used um, with children with cancer. Um, so there are many different ways that we can provide quality children's palliative care services. And as the International Children's Palliative Care Network, we are the global network of individuals and organisations working together to reach the estimated 21 million children that need access to palliative care. So do please uh, work with us, do please contact us um, through our website. Um, as we strive to make sure that children around the world have access to quality palliative care services. So children like this young girl here who 
um, desperately needed help, who desperately needed her pain and symptoms managed, whose family desperately needed to be able to talk through what was happening to their child and they needed the support and care of skilled professionals so that each child and their family who needs it can access children's palliative care. Thank you. Many thanks uh, for this uh, presentation. We received uh, now congratulations from Kinshasa, Congo, about also these uh, topics and the special uh, attention and the relevance of this uh, uh, palliative care. And it uh, was uh, an interesting uh, communication with uh, Professor Gomez and uh, a very interesting uh, information by Bishop uh, Simar about palliative sedation and more information about uh, these uh, topics. And also he explained that in Canada is an unclear uh, concept of uh, relationship between cost and effectiveness with many problems about that. So, thank you. Now, Reverend Tullio Prosepio, I want to introduce you. Uh, he's here live in the presentation, and you are very different from the first five speakers who've been professors in med medicine, but you are a, a lay person, let's say, a medical lay person. Uh, Don Tullio, I think you have completely other aspects. Okay. I, I am a priest, first of all, okay? Um, I'm a chaplain in National Cancer Institute in Milan, uh, but a chaplain in the international view in Italy, the situation is uh, a little bit different. But anyway, I want to, to share some um, uh, reflection about uh, spirituality and religiosity. I very well knows that is different uh, speaking about uh, spirituality and religiosity, but now I don't want to put attention uh, in, these, uh, in these things. Uh, okay, the recent COVID-19 pandemic in which we are still immersed has highlighted the problematic aspects that can help understand the situation in which uh, we are moving. The surprising fact is that a simple virus was enough to destabilize the whole big picture of the global health system. The situation has highlighted that the best research in the clinical or scientific field, together with the highest level technologist, is not able to help, to help support and adequately accompany people who find themselves within a path of illness. What is was lacking most and still is, was good accompaniment, the possibility of being able to accompany the sick in a human way, helping people to recognize meaning in these sad and complicated events. Keeping in all the drama of uh, what everyone experiences personally during the treatment press process, one can grasp as a central aspect uh, the need to live good relationships, the only ones capable of always instilling new hope. Good relationships require the ability to trust each other we meet along the way. This trust, pushes us to progressly, progress progressively day after day, not having the outcome of the journey already assured. This is the fatigue and the joy of living experiences of this type. In this continuous ambivalence remains the promise of the very expectation of hope, which does not lead to passive resignation, but to a progressive, a concrete daily commitment it is also the tireless commitment and effort of, of the care team that strongly testify every day they will not to resign oneself to evil, but a counterattack it with positive actions, both on a clinical and relational level. Such important aspects still do not find adequate recognition in the clinical setting. 
if not at a purely formal level. Modern palliative care strongly recall the need to really put the patient in their entirety and their family with there at the center of attention according to the classic scheme that we know well, physical, social, psychological, spiritual dimension. We must not forget the health workers themselves equally involved in this difficult journey and equally in need of help and sharing their precious service. Is the sick themselves and those directly affected the ask the various actors to seriously consider the request for care according to human need. It's very important an article a few years ago by the New York Times, June 1st, 2015, uh, where in the title uh, you can read that to be sued less, doctors should consider talking to patients more. Unfortunately, not in the palliative care, but unfortunately, very often there is not a real time by entire keep speaking with the patients and loved ones. We know that in palliative care, this is a great moment to create the dialogues with the patients, but I'm very sorry, it's not enough. Also because in the last time of view of life, it's too late for me. And we need to pour more attention also in this aspect. Spiritual support can give more attention and help patients. Very often, this support is underestimated. While the position of the European Parliament in the report October 29, 2018 is completely different. And in this relationship, spirituality is absolutely necessary throughout the way. In the summary, you can read the palliative care aims at improving the quality of life of both patients and their families by addressing not only the physical symptoms associated with the patient's condition, but also in its, its emotional, psychological, spiritual, social and economic repercussions. Palliative care is thus fundamental to human dignity and should be available to all persons who need it. With a view to ensuring access to quality palliative care for everyone who needs it, member states should recognize palliative care as human right and fully integrated into their healthcare system. But the question immediately arises, this is my point of view, who can take part in this particular field and teach others? about spirituality and religiosity. Uh, the chaplains received the, this preparation. It is very interesting way, uh, what we can read again, the pronunciation of the European Parliament. Optimal, optimal palliative care includes not only appropriate medical and therapeutic interventions, but also psychological, spiritual, and emotional support. As part of the palliative care team, the psychologists, social workers, faith leader, minister or counselor or play critical roles that uh, extend uh, beyond the management of the psychological symptoms and syndrome of patients into area that includes existential issues, family and caregiver support and bereavement. I am very proud about it in the European Parliament. You can read the Vatican Pontifical Academy for Life has recently stressed the need for such spiritual care to be provided at local and state level. And indeed, this concern for the provision of spiritual care is shared across different faith, beliefs, and denominations. However, the provision of such support often remains scarce. The last report, The Lancet, published January 31, a few days ago, 2022, is very significant. It is highlighted that the health systems around the world do too much to prolong people's lives and do too little to make end of life less painful. This lack of attention of palliative care would cause much suffering. It uh, should always be remembered that 
by applying palliative care in time in a multidisciplinary perspective, this is a great challenge for everyone. There is a reduction in the overall costs for the care of the sick person. Fewer, fewer hospitalizations in emergency room, reduction of useless therapies in the last stages of lives, and etc. And positively by safeguarding good relationships with patients and family members, litigation is reduced. This is my personal experience. In any case, we believe that uh, there is an insufficient awareness on the part of clinicians that, that uh, palliative care, as the WHO understands it, becomes a gain for the clinicians, can, uh, caregivers, equip uh, themselves, as well as for the patients. We believe it's necessary to, to teach all these attentions within the usual training course provided within the health sector. For this reason, with Progea, Progea Italia, anyway, in agreement with the Joint Commission, we have begun to create real attention for further developments in this specific area. First of all, we would like to recall the importance of the spiritual dimension because this is necessary for the patients and relatives as the international literature show us. Uh, also remembering, uh, I think this is very important that we are not in the world to have health, but we want health to carry out a project in life. Spirituality can help achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don Tullio, uh, for this uh, relevant uh, dimension that is spirituality when we are talking about end of life and uh, palliative care. And uh, uh, now uh, we uh, move in a specific experience. Uh, so which kind of palliative care in the situation of poverty with this experience in Argentina, in Buenos Aires with Buen Samaritano uh, palliative care and the hospice. This is a video recorded uh, by the presentation by Dr. Matthias Nayung and uh, we have uh, the record and of course i repeat uh, for questions uh, by chat for uh, the speakers about uh, geriatrics about uh, children and also about the spirituality uh, all the speakers are uh, linked are connected so from uh, uh, catalonia from uh, uh, uganda uh, Tullio is here, so <laughs> it is more simple. Thank you very much for this invitation. A big hug from Argentina. It's an honor to be here. I would like to speak on behalf of all those who die in poverty, suffering without receiving palliative care. He is Ezequiel. He is uh, 25 years old. He has advanced anal cancer and he's been in terrible pain for weeks. He comes into my office carrying a small bag. He won't take a seat, he stands still. He fills the room with an unpleasant smell. His hands are dirty. He's got a colostomy and a huge perineal wound. He's only finished primary school. He has worked as a dishwasher in bars, but he's jobless now and he has a history of drug abuse. He has no place to live. He stays over wherever they let him in. He's got his mother and seven siblings, but he's been cast out by them. He's a man of few words. He is Ezekiel. Poverty reduces access to palliative care. 76% of people who need palliative live in low and middle income countries. However, 
the availability and access to palliative care service is extremely limited. Of the 25,000 palliative care services identified globally, only 30% are offered in, this, in those countries. In our specialty focus health system, palliative patients are avoided and sometimes invisible. But if they are also poor, they are practically left out of the health system. In Argentina, the Argentinian hospice movement emerged almost 20 years ago as a reaction for these situations. As a complement to the health system, it promoted the creation of hospices throughout the country to take care of the poor who are at the end of life free of charge. It was a response from the civil society with palliative care professional teams and a strong leading role of volunteers. This movement introduced this model to Latin America and helped it spread all across the continent. Would it be possible to combine the technique and efficiency of palliative care with a family center compassionate and transcendent environment? Would it be possible to provide the poor access to vital medical devices for the first time? Could palliative care for the poor be sustained by community support? Whatsoever you do to the least of your brothers and sisters, you do unto me. Proclaim Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, identify himself with the poor. Take care of the sick with the love of a mother for her only sick child and as the Holy Spirit inspires you. Repeat San Camillo in the 15th century. In these quotes, we recognize a strong personal and vocational call to take care of the poor, which centuries later propels us into the dirty streets and into the lives of thousands of people who would otherwise die in suffering. When profession and calling meet, life becomes a mission and this is powerful. Research on the end of life needs of people living in poverty is limited. However, a systematic review showed that people who live in more disadvantaged areas are significantly less likely to receive palliative care. People from a lower socioeconomic background are more likely to die in hospitals, have a higher use of emergency services in the last three months of life, and have less participation in end-of-life decisions. There is evidence that deprivation has negative physical effects such as pain management and dyspnea, as well as affecting the uh, psychological and spiritual well-being. The Lancet report, as you know, describes this inequality as an abyss. The poorest 50% of people globally receive less than 1% of the, of the morphine while the richest 10% of countries use 90% of it. Furthermore, family caregivers living in poverty are more likely to experience moderate to severe depression. The patients imagined by health policy makers have a family, have a home, an education. They also have an income and access to water. A poor patient lacks all these things. Poverty multiplies the palliative needs of these patients, and the total pain coined by Cicely Sonder is amplified as all dimensions are over demanded. Many times I find myself in front of one of such patients asking myself where to start to help. I remember one patient for whom we were more concerned 
about the winter cold in his place than about the liver pain. I also remember a woman whose methadone was to trade weekly, but what really hurt her was the daily violence due to her children's addiction. He is Sebastian, a young man, paraplegic, and scared by a spinal cord compression, living in a humble hut full, full of leaks and spending most of the day alone. Where to start? The complexity of these people's lives is deeper than just the complexity of illness. Thus, palliative care for the poor entails more creativity, more flexibility, more jumbleness, and more support from a team. Pope Francis entitled his letter for the World Day of the Poor in 2021, The Poor You Will Always Have With You, as an invitation to recognize that we are living in the same world. So I'd like to share some learns of this year's working with them. I think the first step is to acknowledge these people and the difficulties they face, to see them, to recognize their humanity. This requires us to overcome the indifference and annoyance that can sometimes be our response to them. We need a strong empathy with the difficult circumstances people face, in stark contrast with those who accuse the poor of being lazy and responsibly for their lot in life. This makes us think of the unbreakable relationship between palliative caregivers and the poor who are exposed to a lot of suffering. We can ease their pain and transform their end-of-life experience thanks to our interventions. Palliative care is inexpensive and efficient. And although not widely available, there is always something we can do to help others. By taking care of these people, we have learned the importance of seeking those who most need this support. Otherwise, it's very hard for them to reach us or any other hospice. In most cases, they don't ask for care because they don't have means for traveling or simply because they are felt that hospital diminished them in the past. Reaching out to them makes them visible. We need a palliative care which goes forth a missionary palliative care. Our home care team of professionals is called missionary hospice instead of hospice at home because it goes out to find patients by bringing the good news. We are willing to take care of you. You are not alone. Most people living in poverty prefer dying at home but the probability of this happening is reduced from 22 to 39 according to studies. They live in shanties, which are a difficult place to live, but are where they want to die. Palliative care creates an environment of abundance in the midst of poverty. In April and May 2020, palliative patients were, were, were removed from hospitals because of the priority was COVID-19. And no citizens could leave their home due to confinement. So we had no choice but to visit our patients and bring morphine from house to house. We had no choice but to take the risk of entering those houses when vaccines had not yet arrived. Taking care of the poor requires breaking some personal boundaries to feel some of the discomfort they experience. We have learned also how important it is to recover the confidence lost as a result of the sanitary mistreatment poor people suffer. They have been out of the health system for their whole lives. They remain anonymous 
because of their illness and social situation. How to be confident and let others take care of you? A recent study found that mistru mistrust in some cases can increase stigma towards palliative care, which is seen as an inadequate substitute for the desired cure and a deprivation of assistance. Active therapist for the rich and morphine for the poor. This is why our first intervention as a hospice is to welcome them by their names. When they arrive, they find their names at the foot of their beds, which ensure they feel welcome and give them the feeling that they were waiting for me. With something too simple but genuine, they stop being a diagnosis and became a person. We also learned that we should ensure and demand the organized availability and provision of essential palliative medicines. In Latin America countries, many health policies have been endorsed when the community understand that pain relief is a right. Making patients aware of this right and educating health teams at different levels is a full-time job. An inherent danger of doing palliative care in low-income context is to medicalize needs which in many cases go beyond the strictly medical. That is to say, searching for medical responses where there is another need. One should try to understand the day-to-day -day reality of their lives, to get involved wherever they are, instead of simply prescribing pain relief. In this kind of teams, volunteers' roles are irreplaceable because they are able to see things the medical team can't. They can go beyond what is written in the books. And they know there are no limits when it comes to relieve pain. For example, they bring mattresses or heaters, do paperwork, buy tickets, bring family members together teach reading, manage the custody of a child, help to bring a family member from prison to see loved ones from the last time, they certainly walk the extra mile. This shows us that human compassion bypasses the barriers imposed by poverty and has the power to embrace and search for solutions where there are none. In my experience, volunteers often understand more than anyone else the importance of caring for the poorest. They establish a genuine and balanced relationship capable of healing. The gratuity of their presence is therapeutic. We are witnesses of the fact that there is a mysterious wisdom, that God wants to teach us something through this important work. We live among all kinds of misery that could be relieved if the poor were to receive palliative care. The palliative care team that approach the poor experience a return to the essential aspects of life. Most of their patients lack what is necessary for their basic needs, but they live in dedication and solidarity amidst their scarcity. Accepting death naturally and putting family and relationships in the center of their lives. Their values and priorities are often admirable and inspiring, causing us to reflect on our own lives. I want to share with you a short video of Ezekiel, the young man which I named at the beginning. Para mí conocer el hockey es muy lindo, me, me gustó mucho y como te, como te dije es una segunda familia que tengo. Acá tengo el amor que necesito, el cariño que no, no tenía en mi casa, 
eh, porque en mi casa siempre hubo peleas o nunca nadie me escuchó y acá sí hay gente que me escucha, me da consejos para salir adelante y eso está muy bueno, me alegra mucho. Más que nada es eso, eh, ayudarnos a salir de ese pozo que decimos ¿Por qué me tocó esto? ¿Por qué tengo esta enfermedad? Y acá no, ustedes nos dan la ayuda para salir adelante Decir no nos sentimos tan tristes, que no nos sentamos eh, asustados Nos dan esa fuerza para salir adelante Es Ezequiel. Finally, we learn how arriving at the hospice helps reset lives. These people arrive at a safe place where they don't feel jacked and where they can find time to go through internal processes unthinkable until that moment. We have the privilege of seeing how physical and material poverty becomes emotional and spiritual richness. These are our outcomes. It becomes a spiritual opening to heaven's hope. Money no longer matters because death does not have the last word. God does, who in his infinite mercy embraces them through our palliative care. Thank you very much. So many thanks and uh, really moving uh, experience, message, and uh, coming from that uh, far country in these uh, difficult situations, but uh, rich of hope and humanity and love and uh, care. So uh, we are the speakers uh, uh, in contact, linked. Please, uh, uh, we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, maximum for uh, questions. Uh, there was a, a question to uh, Professor Gomez about uh, how to, uh, what is the best method for learning palliative care in postgraduate education? I live in Spain, and so thank you for your uh, suggestion. Uh, please, uh, Professor Gomez, can you give uh, uh, an answer to this uh, request, to this question? Oh, uh, thank you very much for this question. I think that there are several methodologies to uh, learn in a postgraduate situation, palliative care. <clears throat> Probably the best is to be very close to a very good palliative care service. That's, that's essential because the day-to-day -day, um, collaboration with the palliative care service is essential to learn uh, how to, to proceed to look after patients and sharing patients with them. That's one method. The second method so, uh, aspects are more formal learning and teaching. And I think in every country, you need three levels of training the first level of training is a basic course that could be multidisciplinary, multidimensional. The second is uh, having um, in, in your training a stage in a palliative care service and combine it with some um, institutional uh, training. And then the third that we have is 
um, the master of palliative care. Unfortunately, in many countries, are, as in Spain, we don't have yet palliative medicine as, as specialty. So this is uh, one of the gaps we have to fulfill. So these are the, the ways of doing so. so please, to, please to speakers for the answers, uh, turn on your camera. Yeah, just now yeah. it's a very good uh, yeah. um, tone, but not a camera, a sound, but not a camera. Yeah, well, <laughs> somebody is banning my camera to be active. Uh, so I couldn't yeah. activate my camera. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry, but uh, I couldn't do that. Sorry. Now we have an additional question. Uh, she asked us uh, for um, an email answer, but I think it's very important for the for the audience here too. Uh, it was addressed to Dr. Nayoun, but also to any other speaker. It's about the palliative care under very certain circumstances in prison for imprisoned patients, patients in prison. Are there any experience? Are there any suggestions? What's about the quality of palliative care in prisons? Who wants, who would like to answer? Dr. Nayoun? Good morning, thank you for your question. Uh, I, I received by the chat, the question is okay. Okay, uh, yes. We, as we, as we, as I read in the, in the chat, I, I, I start with a group of volunteers, our, our hospice. We, 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 we are a group uh, in the beginning uh, link uh, as a, in, in the Catholic church, but working with the community and the, and, uh, and the public hospitals near our, our hospice and we, we, we are trying, we, 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 we did, our daily job is to introduce this kind of model in the, in the, into the public health system. Uh, uh, we need economic support, of course, and, 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 and we work a lot to make conscientious of in, in our donors and, 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 in, and in the society, in the civil society. So it's, um, uh, so it's a, a, a daily challenge to support the care of the, of the poorest, but hospice, uh, we, we now have, uh, we created, we found the hospice 12 years ago and, and um, uh, we, we are now growing up um, uh, in, in our dif difficult situation. Um, helping by 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 our donors and and a growing up conscientious of of the need uh, the, the 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 importance of this of this care for the poorest. <laughs> Professor Scalding wants to answer too. Thank you very much. My question was mainly really for uh, uh, Julia Downing. Um, thank you very much for your uh, really uh, very informative and, and uh, powerful talk. I, I had two questions, two related questions. You mentioned the huge difficulty of trying to set up a service uh, in a low income country when you have nobody who is an expert in the country who can provide training for, uh, uh, for younger and less experienced individuals. And I wondered two things. Firstly, whether you thought uh, that uh, distance learning, remote learning, and remote teaching uh, could uh, play a valuable role in, in, in spreading palliative care skills. And then secondly, in, in Uganda, as you well know, and in many uh, African countries, there are quite well-developed systems of clinical officers who are not uh, doctors, but have uh, quite a high degree of paramedical training. And I wondered, and, and they are dispersed uh, throughout the communities, throughout the countries. Uh, very well developed in, in, in Uganda. Uh, and I wondered whether you thought that, that these clinical officers uh, might represent a resource that could be adapted towards uh, providing uh, palliative care for children. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for those questions. Um, I think the first one around education, yes, definitely distance learning. Um, as the uh, International Children's Palliative Care Network, we've got a range of free um, e-learning materials, um, e-learning courses, um, which you can study for at home. But also, I think one of the things the pandemic has shown us that even in uh, low resource settings, it is possible to do hybrid training and online trainings via Zoom. We've done lots of training um, via uh, different um, platforms um, on children's palliative care and, and palliative care generally as well. Um, so that has been really good. And, and also having some real um, case discussions where uh, people are able to share particularly difficult cases with experts and, and get some um, support from that. So there are different ways that distance learning is used um, in trying to develop uh, children's palliative care. Um, of course, seeing palliative care um, in children um, in, in action is really important. And so looking at how we can um, find uh, some way of that clinical experience. I was talking with somebody just uh, last week about um, an individual who's going to go over and do some ward rounds with them. So we're sending one person there who can then um, go with some of the uh, nurses and doctors and clinical officers uh, around the wards and do some hands-on training. So looking at different ways of providing that training. And yes, certainly, I mean, I think, and I know we have colleagues from Uganda on this call, but clinical officers are a key part of our response for palliative care, both for adults and children within, um, within Uganda and within other um, African countries and within other countries where they have a similar, a similar CADA. Um, so it's making sure that um, all those who come into contact with children and their families um, have some training, ideally, on children's palliative care. And yes, we need to use the re many resources that we have got available. So, thank, thank you. you. And ca can I just add um, on that, that previous question on prisons? Um, again, uh, Hospice Africa Uganda and the Palliative Care Association of Uganda have work um, in the prisons in Uganda. I myself have been um, in providing palliative care in the prisons um, in Uganda. Uh, likewise, um, in many other countries um, in, in the UK, um, last year we had a really good webinar um, around COVID and palliative care with colleagues from the Humane Prison Hospice Project. And I think uh, Catherine Pettis is on this call as well, and she's uh, linked in with that. So they are, would be good resources to contact um, for uh, more information for Amy on um, palliative care in prisons. Thank you. Uh, a question to uh, Don Tullio, uh, for example. But in our more secularized society, which uh, new challenge about uh, spirituality? So the impact at the end of life is a kind of uh, new experience for many people that they live without uh, religion, spirituality, or is a comeback for the childhood uh, to, <laughs> to rediscover a kind of spirituality? Good question. It's not too easy to answer it, but um, uh, why is not too easy? Because there is, uh, until now, there is a great um, uh, agreement about uh, the definition uh, uh, like spirituality. What does it mean, spirituality? I can give uh, one uh, position, everyone can give his position. Uh, I think that uh, uh, everyone is a spiritual one because spirituality uh, is very simple, the meaning of life. Believer or not believer, and then who is believer? What does it mean, believer? The meaning, I don't know really. I know, but I don't know in the real situation. Um, this uh, question, what is the meaning of my life? Not only in the end of life. For this reason, I think that palliative care start uh, immediately when, when unfortunately I find uh, in the bad situation uh, because I'm sick. Um, step by step, uh, you can recognize what is the meaning of your life. For someone it could be foundation in the religion position, 
uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, Jewish, what you want. Uh, for everyone without this position, but anyway, everyone is spiritual, spiritual ones. I don't know. Thank you, probably the last uh, question because the time is running away to all three online speakers. Uh, the, the expression that palliative care is a return to essentials. In your opinion, so in geriatrics, in pediatrics, and uh, in poverty or difficult situation, what is the meaning of a return to essentials? So in other way, palliative care, uh, there is a discussion, it is pre-modern medicine or post-modern medicine. In your opinion, what is, what is your answer? I, I, maybe I, I try to, to begin. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, maybe I try to begin and, and my colleagues also follow me. Uh, I, I, I put a photo in, in, in that moment with a young woman with her little child. I think one of, one of the things that uh, they, we learn about them is the importance to put the family uh, on the center, the, the family and the people and, and their humanities in the center of the, of the care. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, alleviating their pain and other symptoms, but uh, put them and their humanities in the, in the center of, of care as, as, as they teach us, uh, as, as in that photo, they teach us. Well, one approach. Uh, thanks, uh, Julia Doning. Thank you. Um, I, I'd agree. I mean, it's about having the child and their family at the centre of the care. It's about, um, it, in many ways, demedicalising de um, the care that we're providing. It's about showing that compassion and ensuring quality of life and having that child and the family as the centre of the care uh, rather than us as doctors and nurses or clinical <coughs> officers. Um, and just showing that compassion. And if you want to think about compassion as, as essential, which I believe it is, then yes, we need to be showing that compassion in all that we do. Thanks, uh, Gomez. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very uh, essential question because and when we teach palliative care in medical students at sec on the second course, we have um, three days sessions looking at the essential needs of patients and families. The essential needs are spirituality, dignity, uh, comfort, com and the way to uh, answer to these uh, essential needs is uh, compassion. And the organization of compassion is palliative care in general. So I think that uh, palliative care is essential in the way that we apply compassion in an organized way to people who are in a very vulnerable uh, situation of need and, and who are suffering from uh, end of life or uh, chronic conditions. So I think it's, it's true. It's like the ecology of the healthcare system. It's clean, it's fresh, it's uh, green, I know. And it's uh, uh, focused to essential needs of patients and families. So we are very proud to be doctors in palliative care for this reason. So many thanks. It is a return to the future. Uh, <laughs> so uh, may, many thanks to all uh, speakers and uh, uh, Professor Sita as a co-chair. And uh, to, uh, many thanks again to all participants, also in a great number of this afternoon. And uh, we conclude these two days in English language. That was a very international webinar about uh, the situation, the perspective, the challenges of uh, uh, palliative care. And uh, it is in charge of the Academy, the Pontificia Academy uh, for Life, to keep in touch and to follow the development. And many thanks to all people who can send uh, uh, experiences, messages, documents, uh, biography, references about uh, this uh, important uh, field. 
Uh, tomorrow, uh, we have a, only an Italian section. Try to see what, uh, how is it the development in Italy of uh, uh, palliative care. Thomas, is there something to say? Actually, one sentence. Most scientific medical articles end with a, a phrase like further research uh, has to be done. And I think further, uh, further on, we have to have some more meetings about this topic. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>